It wasn't just a couple of misplaced memos. In a nearly 50-page indictment detailing 37 charges, including potential violations of the Espionage Act, federal prosecutors accuse former President Donald Trump of illegally holding onto hundreds of classified and top-secret documents. The documents included info about defense and weapons capabilities, U.S. nuclear programs, and potential vulnerabilities of the U.S. and its allies, all of which would pose serious damage to national security in the wrong hands. Prosecutors say Trump kept all of that sensitive information strewn about his Florida estate, with boxes stacked up in offices, a storage room, a bathroom, and the ballroom of Mar-a-Lago. The feds also include a conversation that makes it clear Trump knew what he was doing was wrong. After showing a writer, a publisher, and two of his staffers a series of documents, he said, quote, isn't that amazing? Except it's like highly confidential, secret. This is secret information. Look, look at this. Trump even later acknowledged that the documents weren't declassified, saying, see, as president, I could have declassified it. Now I can't, you know, but this is still a secret. Now, however, ahead of his indictment, the former president and current presidential candidate says he did nothing wrong. I'm an innocent man. I'm an innocent person. That's up for a judge to decide. I'm now joined by Michael Astru, former associate counsel to George H.W. Bush and Ronald Reagan. Thanks, Mike, well, for thanks coming for today. Me. Yeah. Very much appreciate it. To start with, can you just let us know what's going to be happening tomorrow? Well, what's going to happen is going to be basically the start of the trial. And one of the things that's a little bit of a surprise is Judge Eileen Cannon, who handled the civil part of the, uh, this dispute. Um, is looks like she's going to be handling the trial. And that is going to be a little bit of a game changer. If you look at how she handled the civil trial, um, she leaned over way far over in favor of President Trump, and she didn't show very much of an understanding of the Constitution, and she got slapped down pretty nastily by the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. So the first thing is to see um, how Judge Cannon is handling some of these early motions. That's important. The second thing that I think is important to look for is what kind of legal team does he have at this point? Um, uh, President Trump has always been tough on lawyers, tough on I think a lot of his employees, but particularly on lawyers. He hasn't had particularly effective legal representation since he left the White House until fairly recently. His recent team I think has been reasonably impressive, but They've all either quit or been fired. It's hard to know what. And I think he's down to one with lawyer, the last I heard. So my guess is that the first thing that will happen will be a request um, for a delay and that he does not have effective representation of counsel. And I think that may be a sign of what's to come. Because if you read the actual indictment, and I encourage everyone to do it, and PBS has done us all a great service by putting it online on their website. So I encourage everyone. It's pretty simple and straightforward. If you're a junior high school student, you're going to be able to go online and read this and understand it. And I think it helps a lot uh, to understand what's going on. He doesn't have a lot of, President Trump does not have a lot of real good options here. Um, so yeah, that was so interesting you said about reading the, the documents. I read them also. Yeah. And yes, there's so much interesting um, stuff for anybody to, right. to read. Um, as we saw just now, he said he did nothing wrong. Um, he calls it a witch hunt, that it's po politically motivated. What, um, like, and he compares himself to President Biden, who we also found classified documents in his garage, in his house, and Hillary Clinton's emails. What's the difference? What distinguishes what he did to, to that? It's a very skillful indictment. Um, so when you read the indictment carefully, what they've done basically is anticipate that objection. And so the actual removal of the documents from the White House to uh, residences in Florida and New Jersey really isn't the basis for any of the counts. Everything goes to basically what happened after the government started saying, we need to get these back. And, and did they get them back at that point? Was it truthful? Was there other, essentially, obstruction? And so that's how they built their whole case. So it limits the um, president's ability to come back and, and you know, scream uh, selective prosecution. But even if they hadn't done that, 
it's not much of a defense. There was a 1996 Supreme Court case called Armstrong that pretty much blew out um, selective prosecution as a defense in criminal cases. Peter Navarro, who was a senior official at the Trump White House, tried to raise one recently and he got blown out of the water in the courts as well. So it doesn't help from a legal matter. The, the only little wedge there is is if you make this case effectively in the court of opinion and it starts infiltrating to, to people who serve on the jury, as much as you try to screen people from that, you can't 100%. Um, and to the extent that that takes, you could see someone, you could see a juror or two holding out because they have this sense of unfairness, even though the judge, if the judge is handling the case correctly, will tell the jury that they're not allowed to consider that. And if the judge breaks ranks again and does something unusual, then they'll have to do it all over again and the Court of Appeals will tell her exactly um, how she has to instruct the jury. So it's been um, pretty impressive already that we're hearing, or not impressive, that it's expected that we're hearing a lot of supporters of Donald Trump going along with this idea that it's a witch hunk mm -hmm. and also saying that this is actually a declaration of war, an act of war to the, the um, United States. Um, one of the people who we've heard speak is former gubernatorial candidate Carrie Lake from Arizona, who, who said this. If you want to get to President Trump, you're going to have to go through me, and you're going to have to go through 75 million Americans just like me. Most of us are card-carrying members of the NRA. How concerned are you about threats of violence like that? Well, I'm very concerned. I mean, um, you know, we've had January 6th. Um, I think that some of the fabric of our democracy has been torn, and people are more willing to resort to violence than in the past. And it's on both extremes. Um, but um, people like Carrie Lake um, are deliberately stirring it up, and I think that's reprehensible. When we look at... Um before January 6th, sort of the before that happened to this, where we're looking, what's the difference between then and now? Is there, I mean, is there, we are concerned, but do you, do you think the, the validity of it is, is really there? Or what can you tell us about the differences? The differences? Of before the roll-up of January 6th to now, and are we, is the government more prepared for something? Or yeah. is it a different, are we in a different place? I, I think that, I think we've been moving in this direction um, slowly for a long time and then more aggressively in recent years. Um, and, um, and rage is much more part of um, voters' decision-making than it used to be. I hadn't done door-to-door um, -door for 20 years, but I did in the New Hampshire primary in 2016. And one of the things that was strikingly difficult, I mean, they've always been a tough crowd up there, but um, the number of people who would just come to the door and scream at me, not knowing even which campaign I was with, was remarkable. And the number of people who were trying to decide bet between Sanders and Trump was remarkable because it was all about which candidate was channeling the rage. So we've moved to being a much more angry culture. Um, the Washington culture has changed. Um, when I served in the White House, it was still close enough to the Watergate era that the Watergate reforms were pretty sacrosanct. And on a bipartisan basis, you know, the lawyers for um, Carter helped us when we came in. We helped the Clinton lawyers, you know, when they came in. There was this feeling, really, of we don't want to go down this road again. Um, but when I was back in Washington the last time, I could observe that a lot of those things um, were eroded in the and the, the care for the ethics reviews um, and the FBI background checks, a lot of that had been thrown out. Um, and that's very disturbing. And, and, and you just get those things, those little things that are the basis for a secure democracy have been eroded fairly substantially. So what do you think the government should do now to make sure that, that we don't have a repetition of January 6th? Well, um, I think... I don't know what the government can do. Um, I mean, the government can provide more security in situations like this and that kind of thing. But ultimately, you know, this is a cultural problem. We don't believe and protect democracy 
the way that we once did. And so I think that it's important for groups that can have a say on this to get together, get together on a bipartisan basis and try to work together to move us back in the direction where we're talking to each other civilly, we're respecting the laws that have been passed, we periodically review the laws to make sure that they still make sense. And that kind of dialogue is just not happening in Washington anymore. So we need prominent groups to do that. We need individuals to start pressing their elected representatives to, to do this, to tell them that this is important. And, and you know, it's going to be hard, but that's, I think, what needs to happen. So uh, we're heading into this new criminal case, and as well as several others that are likely showing up. Just in this one in particular, what do you think the timeline is? Well, that's going to be very interesting because um, President Trump, as I said, doesn't have a lot of options. I think one of them is to have a ground war and try to delay it um, through the election. Um, and then if he wins, um, we'll go right into a full constitutional crisis. But you know, he may see that as his only way through. And so I'm reasonably confident that we'll start seeing delaying tactics, that we'll see a request for delay so that he can get a full legal team. Um, he may go ahead and try to do the selective prosecution defense, just simply to eat up time to have Judge Cannon decide and then possibly have to go up to the Court of Appeals again to get, get her decision clarified if it's not correct. I mean, there's a lot of things that a skilled legal team can do to delay a criminal trial. I mean, you think, I mean, how long did it take to prosecute, you know, the, um, the bombers here? Um, so um, I think we're going to see delaying tactics, and I think the hope is going to be on the Trump side that he wins the election, then he doesn't have to worry about it anymore. Do you think that having all these ongoing, uh, already he's been indicted twice in the last two months, both in state and federal court, we have several coming up. Yeah. I mean, do you think in any way this helps his case? Um, ultimately, I don't think so. I mean, if you read the, the polls, um, it hasn't had the impact that it traditionally, um, this kind of result would have. And I think that goes back to my point before that, Americans are so angry that they're really not looking at things with a, a clear eye. You know, they've made up their minds, they're angry about it, and they're not going to change their opinion. So it's not hurting him for the moment um, as much. Um, on the other hand, this is a long, drawn-out process. A lot of this evidence that's laid out in the indictment is not pretty. Um, and at some point, I do think there will start to be an erosion of support. Um, I think that the party establishment, such as it is, um, is actually going to start worrying about winning the elections next year. Um, so there are a lot of things that can happen. But, it, you know, he's not going to go away. It's, he's not going to crumble easily. And I think there's some possibility that he's going to be able to drag this trial out, you know, the full year and a half that it would take to... Um, you know, uh, get his only path through, I think. What do you think are the most alarming parts of the indictment? Well, it's hard for me to rank them because I'm just, I have a very strong visceral reaction. I mean, having worked at the White House and handled a lot of secure documents, I mean, I handled most of the end of Iran-Contra, for instance, so, um, you know, uh, the whole notion that you would do anything other than go to the safe, take out the documents only when you needed them to do what you needed to do and then not put them back in the safe is, you know, appalling to me. I had a colleague who was disciplined um, because he had taken out uh, secure documents from his safe, worked on them, forgotten to put them back in the safe. His office was locked. The old executive office building is a very secure building, but they went around and checked for these kinds of the evening, they saw secured, uh, national security documents on his desk, and he got an official reprimand for that. So, I mean, that's the environment that I worked in, um, where they took it with that degree of seriousness, and that's really instilled into my core. So all these things, I mean, there's, there's a whole bunch of, you know, it's, it's in the bathroom, it's being showed to this person, you know, it's in the kitchen, it's, you know, it's falling out of boxes, and it's mixed in with... You know, other th I mean, there's a lot and of... And also actually saying that he wanted to keep that information from prosecutors. Yes, yes. And all those, I mean, so uh, 
I'm just basically, by a lot of the allegations, I'm horrified by them. You know, assuming that they're true, they're horrible. Um, I don't know how to rank them. You know, what is, what is the worst, what is the least worth? I just react so viscerally to them, I can't, can't rank them. Okay, well, um, we're, we're close to done. I'd love to ask okay. you what your last thoughts are on, on this as we're moving forward, if you can give us some final thoughts. Yeah, um, I think that um, this is not gonna be a pretty spectacle. I mean, I think this is going to be um, ugly. I think that at the end of the day, I, that um, former President Trump is going to have trouble um, recruiting and holding on to a top legal team. You know, he went for all the, <clears throat> the election um, challenges. You know, he had a clown show for lawyers. The lawyers he's had for the criminal defense have been much better, but as I mentioned before, they're gone. So I think the first thing to look for is, is he going to be able to recruit quality lawyers? Is he going to be able to use the fact that he has to do that as the first start for a delay? That may be a sign of what they're trying to do tactically. Um, and then you have to settle in because I don't think that this, even though this has a lot of the features of an open shut case, if you're looking at it objectively, the way the process works, it's not going to be open and shut quickly. I think this is going to be long, painful, and not people will be very glad, I think, when it's over. Well, thank you so much for okay. your time. Mike Astrew, it's so great to have you here. Thanks we for appreciate me. your time. Yeah.